Hello and welcome back to the healthcare and complicated YouTube channel. Before I go ahead with another magnificent guest, make sure you subscribe to the channel and check all the previous content there. And also let me acknowledge our channel partners. And today gives me great pleasure to introduce you to David Shulkin. He's the ninth secretary of the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. David, how are you? Very good. Glad to be with you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for accepting my invite. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And the topic today is new models for treating chronic pain. David, can you give us some examples of the, those new models, please? Yeah, well, I first of all got very interested in this topic when I was secretary of the Department of Veteran Affairs because so many veterans suffer from chronic pain, about twice as many as you would find in the general population. And so it was really part of our mission to develop new models for treating patients with chronic pain, because frankly, our traditional models are failing us and people are turning to opioids and uh, substance abuse and suicide and all sorts of terrible adverse consequences when they're not receiving the right treatment. So what I've gotten interested in is the use of pain neuroscience to really treat what is a central nervous system disorder when the brain gets used to being in a state of sustained pain and using those tools in our healthcare delivery system to help patients get relief from chronic pain. Brilliant, fantastic. I mean, you've done a lot of work around, around healthcare. What do you think needs to be changed in terms of the healthcare delivery within the healthcare systems in, in order to bring these new, new models and new approaches to be effective and also to be implemented? Well, there are many things that are problematic in our health care system that prevent us from doing what, frankly, we know how to do best. Uh, one of those is our reimbursement system. The continued reliance on fee-for-service medicine, the fact that people particularly providers are rewarded for doing interventions and surgical procedures over taking the time that it takes to be able to deliver good, compassionate, thorough care is a structural problem in our system so that you can't get people to be able to focus sometimes on the right things. And our system still puts interventions like injections and medications and surgical procedures over providing the biopsychosocial support models that frankly many patients with chronic illness need and require including those who suffer from chronic pain so that's one thing the second thing i would say is our system of educating healthcare professionals including physicians of course one of which i'm a physician trained us all to be individual practitioners and not to work in teams or to work in interdisciplinary approaches. And again, when you're dealing with what chronic pain patients often need, a full comprehensive biopsychosocial support system, that requires interdisciplinary care, it requires integrated care and team-based approaches to care. And that just isn't something that comes natural to the way that we train our healthcare professionals in this country. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Uh, certainly, there are structural problems around the world, but in the United States, you have a very different model of, um, of care. Unfortunately, is that uh, paradigm around the money and around where things should be moving, so it's difficult to change the structure, uh, unfortunately, and you have that first-hand experience. Um, but you mentioned that uh, there are many many other challenges you know healthcare is complicated overall um is complexity you know i'm i talk to a lot of people around the world and it's always like from regulation to innovation to implementation to interoperability so many so many issues is there anything that you'd like to highlight to demystify these complexities in order to for example you mentioned um, the clinicians and the clinicians one 
don't have the right health education and don't have the time to get it. So it's a bit of a, a vicious circle. And I'll give you an example. In here in UK, the other day I saw actually a face GP, a face to face GP. I had a consultation for about eight minutes. And I had eight minutes because I talked about the previous condition, asthma, that I had in my childhood. If I didn't talk about that, I probably would have a three, four minutes face to face. How do you see that, the, the overstrain on clinicians and also these dynamics, no time for health education, less delivery quality? How do you see these things evolving? Well, I guess I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, I'm a strong believer that patients need to be the manager of their own health care. That doesn't mean that they have to have all the information and know how to treat every healthcare condition, but they have to be their own advocates. And if you can't be your own advocate, you need somebody else to be your advocate, whether it's a family member, a caregiver, a loved one, or a paid advocate, because the healthcare system, unfortunately, too often put the needs of the patient lower down than where it really belongs, which is at the very top. And when you start seeing clinicians rushing people, they're responding to the system that they work in, but that system is forgetting that this should be about the patient. The second thing I would mention is, is that when you see a system that is working, what you would call best practice, that's where the rest of the industry should focus and, and try to emulate. And I was privileged enough to lead the largest healthcare system in the United States, the Department of Veteran Affairs, that frankly, it's not a perfect system, but it does some things well. Without this focus on having to be paid for what you do, it's outside of a traditional reimbursement system. It works more like the national health system in the, in the UK you can focus on what's right for the patient and not have to worry about maximizing reimbursement. The second thing is the clinicians are not under these time pressures so that they can get, they can give the time required to the veteran who's in front of them. And having watched and witnessed that after a career outside of the VA in the private sector, there are many things about the VA healthcare system that I think the rest of the country and the rest of the world should begin to start thinking about. Fantastic. Thank you for mentioning this amazing example and bringing that to fruition and to attention of everybody else. Very, very important putting the patient at the center, but also at the top. And it's very yes. difficult to get the two right, the center and the top. So, right. David, is there anything else that you, you'd like to mention in terms where um, the health care is delivered now? Any vision for the future anything else before before we round up yeah i think we've seen lots of pieces of evidence that the healthcare system can be more effective if you just look at what we've all lived through around the world in the pandemic we saw the use of virtual care and the use of technology as a necessity unfortunately we're now watching healthcare begin to walk back some of those advances and learnings now that people believe that the pandemic is getting better. And I think that's somewhat unfortunate because you had mentioned the complexity in healthcare. All the complexity in healthcare is self-imposed. It's a system designed by human beings. And a lot of that is regulations and, and uh, rules that make the system very hard to use and frankly are barriers to delivering care. So the regulations in the United States around telehealth can frankly prevent delivering good access to healthcare. And I believe that we need to continue to push on refining those regulations, not bringing them back to the pre-pandemic days. So when you take a look at what I'm now working on uh, in a company called Override, Override.Health, it's actually using virtual models to deliver interdisciplinary team-based care to patients who suffer from chronic pain. And I believe that this can allow for greater access, this can allow for better quality, it can reduce our healthcare costs. And these types of models that are out there need to continue to be pushed to improve our system so people can benefit from our system. 
Brilliant, David. We come to the latter end of the episode. I have one last item for you, which seems like a simple question. It's how can we make healthcare and complicated? <clears throat> well, I think that in order to make anything more user friendly, and I'm going to use that as a as as another word for uncomplicated, so that you can use a healthcare system in a way that makes it easy to use, you have to think about it from the patient perspective. And unfortunately, our healthcare system has been thought about it exactly opposite. It's been thought about it from the people who pay for healthcare, like the government or the employer or the insurance company. It's been thought about from the provider perspective. How do we make the system easier for a physician or another healthcare professional? But we've gotten that backwards. If you start with the patient, what they want in terms of accessible, understandable, compassionate care, you would have a very different type of healthcare system. And frankly, in most consumer goods, you get rewarded for providing a product that people want to use, like to use, understand how to use. And healthcare needs to get to where those other companies are. Brilliant. That's a fantastic way to to round up and end it there. David, I would like to thank you for your time, for accepting my invite, for your amazing contribution and your insights in here. And um, yeah, thank you so much for accepting the invite and being in here. Pleasure to be with you today. I'm going to round up now. So to all our viewers and the listeners, make, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also, I'm going to post David's socials in here, his LinkedIn and social media make sure you follow his work connect with him ask him questions he certainly has a lot to give and i'll see you all next time